A while ago, back when I was a yellow Yoshi, I posted a video detailing how to properly fix the battery in Gen 3, and it seems to help a lot of people. But suffice to say, it was far from a perfect video. I feel like I need to correct some mistakes and explain some things further. I've gotten a lot of questions in the comments that I've been trying to answer since, but finally, I figured that if several people have been asking the same questions, I might as well make a follow-up in video form, just so that everyone can be on the same page. So before we continue, I highly suggest watching the original video if you haven't already, because a lot of the information I gave is still relevant. This is just building on top of that, but as a very brief overview, Generation 3, specifically Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, keeps track of time using a real-time clock or RTC, which uses a battery much like a Tamagotchi. It keeps ticking even when the system isn't running until, inevitably, the battery dies. Lucky for us, our save files are intact when the battery runs dry, hence why we get this message. But unlucky for us, time will stop until you replace the battery, but even after replacing it, the clock will not work properly unless you take extra steps to fix it. I originally made this video because I wanted to grow my berries above all else, but but over time, as more people commented about their different experiences with Gen 3, it turns out I was tapping into a whole lot more information that I didn't explore the first time. So let's get into it. Despite my best efforts, I've gotten some snippets of info wrong and I do apologize for that. These mistakes weren't super integral to the video, but mistakes nonetheless. The first thing I got entirely wrong was the Gen 3 save methods. In the original video, I said, Thankfully, unlike Gens 1 and 2, your save file should be intact, since it's saved in a different component called the SRAM chip which I didn't know was wrong until someone corrected me in the comments. The reason I thought it was SRAM was because the motherboards for Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald looked one way, and the Fire Red and Leaf Green motherboards looked another way. So I was like, oh, they must be completely different types of memory then. There are four variations of how GBA games save, but the Pokemon GBA games actually share the same type of memory. According to this Reddit comment, the types are SRAM, FRAM, EPROM, and FLASHRAM. The two that we're concerned about are SRAM and FlashRAM. SRAM relies on a battery to retain information, but also saves quickly. FlashRAM does not need a battery to save, but the save time is longer than SRAM. Gens 1 and 2 use SRAM, while Gen 3 uses FlashRAM. That's why saving in Gen 3 takes a bit more time than Gens 1 or 2, and that is also why in Ruby, Sapphire, or Emerald, your save file is okay when the battery dies. At the time, I saw the term SRAM and I was like, like, good enough for me, and just threw it into my notes. I probably mixed it up with the original Game Boy games, so let's take a look at the PCB itself to clear up any misinformation. In the first video, I said the chip behind the battery was the SRAM chip, which is completely wrong. It's not even flash RAM, it's actually the mask ROM chip, a type of read-only memory, aka not where the saves are stored. The flash RAM chip is actually located to the left, and side note, the RTC is right above it which is powered by the aforementioned battery. I got all of this information from this very insightful video. If you'd like to know more, strangely, according to this Bulbapedia page, it says, the save data structure for Generation 3 is stored in the cartridge's battery-backed RAM chip, SRAM, which based on multiple other sources, is not true at all. This is probably where I thought the GBA games used SRAM. Granted, I didn't read the note saying this article isn't complete, so we're remember to always verify with multiple sources. Also yes, I did accidentally say RCT many times instead of RTC. RCT 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 It's fine. I also came across comments that needed further explanation from me. By far, the absolute most common question I received was, if I replaced my battery and restarted my file, do I still need to do those extra flashcard steps? Okay, let me say it loud and clear. 
No. You do not need to take those extra steps if you restart your file with a fresh battery. To be fair, I only offhandedly mentioned it in the last video, so I don't blame anyone for the confusion. But now you know. Before I knew any of these tools, restarting felt like the only way to fix the battery. The whole point of compiling this guide was so you didn't have to lose your save file. If you're completely fine with wiping your data, go right ahead. All you really need to do is replace the battery, make a new save, Save, and you're good to go. But for me, I hated losing all those hours of progress I will never get back, and I didn't make backups of my saves. I restarted my emerald twice, with hundreds of hours invested. So by the third time, I was not about to lose all that progress again. And you might be thinking, if this happens so frequently, why even bother replacing it in the first place? Well, it's because I was dumb. The first time I replaced the battery, I used used a standard coin cell battery you'd get at like CVS, which was way too big for the cartridge. Since those weren't pre-tabbed and I didn't have a soldering iron, I resorted to electrical tape, which I've said before is unreliable because the second those prongs stop touching the battery, the clock will no longer work and you're back to square one. So it wasn't that the battery ran out so quickly, I just didn't take the proper steps to replace it. I'll say it again, soldering is way better in safer than electrical tape. Another interesting comment I received more than once was, what if you restart your file with a dead battery already and then replace it? I never thought about this situation. To be honest, I haven't tested this myself because I don't want to have to resolder the battery, but based on my research, if the game never kept track of time to begin with, there shouldn't be a reason for the clock to mess up when the battery is replaced, at least in this situation. Remember, the RTC should be counting right when you set the clock in your room. In the the time stops working properly when the RTC value is lower than the save file timestamp. Since both of these values would have been frozen on January 1st, 2000, the moment you replace the battery, I think it's reasonable to assume that the clock would just work properly again. I might be completely wrong and it still messes up, but thankfully we have the tools to fix it. I also tried to research much more about the RTC. It's been a journey trying to figure out how these values interact with each other, along with having to wait in real time to check if the clock is still working. So if I got anything wrong, please feel free to comment below. I tested between three separate games, dumping and editing the saves to see what's really going on. I used PK Hex in Pokemon Chess to cross-reference these values. So the initial time seems to be when the player sets the clock at the beginning of the game, which should be on January 1st, 2000. The value is represented by days, hours, minutes, and seconds. And the elapsed time is most likely how much time has passed in real life since the initial time. More often than not, if you reset the initial time to all zero, time should be working again. My copy of Sapphire was an outlier though, where time didn't seem to pass at all after I changed the values. I even checked with the old man in Pacific the dog town that gives you a TM every seven days, and he told me to come back in over a thousand days. I even started a new save file and checked the RTC values immediately after, and while the initial time wasn't all zero, it was still lower than the elapsed time, so clearly something was wrong. But for my copies of Ruby and Emerald, time was working just fine, even after setting all the values to zero. Granted, I was using someone else's file for Sapphire, plus this cart hasn't had its battery run dry yet, and time was working fine before I changed anything. So maybe the game doesn't like you changing the RTC values if it works perfectly fine in the first place? Kinda confusing. Honestly, this is all the more reason to just use RTC read once you replace the battery. It's the most efficient way to actually get the clock working without fail. I remember the first time someone asked about RNG manipulation, I was completely blindsided. I had never heard of this term before, so I did the responsible thing and referred them to someone else because I was not about to make a clown out of myself. I was avoiding it for the longest time because this topic was honestly intimidating, but after some time, I figured I'd try to actually learn what this thing is if I wanted to be more thorough. According to Bulbapedia, RNG abuse or RNG 
manipulation is a procedure that manipulates the pseudo-random generators to obtain a specific Pokemon. Much like how rolling a die isn't truly random, computers can't actually produce random results. So programmers try their best to implement code that produces as close to random as possible. But even with the most advanced algorithm, if you start with the same exact inputs and conditions, the result will be the same every time. And people use this fact to their advantage. In the mainline Pokemon games, RNG determines things like encounters, IVs, natures, shininess, all sorts of things. Players use this mechanic for things like shiny hunting or perfect IVs because otherwise it would take forever. This requires a lot of preparation and frame perfect inputs, so it's not exactly accessible. I'm not even scratching the surface of how deep this rabbit hole is, but how does this exactly relate to the battery? I said the same thing too. In Ruby and Sapphire, the seed for the RNG is determined by the internal clock. See where this is going? So when the battery dies, you actually get a fixed seed, meaning it's much easier to predict what frames to hit and when. This could be really useful or detrimental, depending on your situation. Emerald is an interesting beast. The RNG in this game is actually glitched with the fixed seed, regardless of the battery. So in the case of Emerald, you don't really need to fix the battery for RNG manipulation. I've included links in the description that go way more in depth about this, if you want to know more. So basically, yes, technically a dead internal battery does affect RNG manipulation, but only in Ruby and Sapphire, and it depends on if it serves you better or not. I briefly mentioned in the last video that the RTC issue was kind of like the berry glitch, but not really. I didn't seem to explain it well enough because I still got comments asking about this. Admittedly, I didn't know too much outside of, it doesn't fix my berries, but I got this really insightful comment from Sonic about how exactly the berry glitch doesn't fix the clock. Not much information about this patch is readily available, so I trust that this information is correct. Sonics also made a video about it if you want to learn more. Apparently, the berry patch doesn't apply at all if the clock had been interrupted in any way. It thinks that you've somehow tampered with the battery, so it doesn't let you enjoy the passage of time. It also doesn't apply if the RTC is out of sync, because of course, I definitely think that players should have had the option to reset the clock if they needed to, just like in Gen 2. There's no harm in at least trying the berry patch, but if it doesn't fix the clock for you, now you know why. So we're familiar with the RTC read method, but what about other methods? Well, thankfully I came across more solutions to cater to whatever your situation is. If you still own a flashcard, might I suggest Pokemon Chest, oh, hey, that rhymed. a homebrew app, which is part Pokemon Bank, part save file editor, and part Pokemon generator. It has a full suite of features, including a way to directly edit the RTC. This is definitely a more advanced tool, but it's very intuitive. And it looks very fancy. If you're having trouble opening up the app, Try updating your flashcards firmware. Since we're just concerned about fixing our clock, all we need to do is press X to open up the menu, select your trainer card, and scroll down to RTC initial time. I suggest resetting the initial RTC values to all zeros. You might also need RTC read to match your real life time, but after doing some tests, as long as you reset the initial RTC and then adjust the time in RTC read, the clock should be accurate. In the original video, I said that you need to offset the time by guessing and checking, but now I know that the initial RTC seems to be adding that weird buffer to the clock. And since we're modifying values in our games, you might be worried about corrupting your save in the process, so this is a good reminder to please make backups of your save files if you can. I recommend this GBA backup tool for DS flashcards. Just follow the instructions and now you have a backup on your computer for safekeeping. In case anything goes wrong, you can easily restore the save back into your cart. If you don't have a flash cart, but still want to back up your saves, I recommend getting a Game Boy cart dumper. It's just like the GBA backup tool without the need of a console. There are countless devices out there, but one I'd like to highlight is the Epilogue GB Operator. You may have heard of this before, but it's an all-in-one device that lets you play, 
backup and restore your Game Boy games. It's very handy and I even have one for myself. It's a little pricier than a flash cart, but if you're willing to invest, it's more than worth it. Now that we have our save files backed up, you can also fix the RTC directly on the computer. Again, there are countless Pokemon save editors out there, but a popular one seems to be PKHex. I mainly use this program to double check that my save isn't corrupted when I back it up. You can enable a secret event flag to reset the time in-game, though it's not too helpful because it doesn't tell you the calendar date, just the number of days, hours, and minutes. If you're editing the save file anyway, you could just max out your inventory if you wanted, but we're trying to stay as authentic as possible. So to review, if you only have a DS flash cart, you can fix the RTC using Pokemon Chess and or RTC Read. You can also back up your save using the GBA backup tool, which you can then transfer to the computer and also fix the RTC there. If you don't have a flash cart, you can get a Game Boy cart dumper, directly transfer your saves to the computer, and go from there. So there do exist more options to fix the battery that should cater to whatever tools you have available. No more reluctantly restarting our files because of the clock. I also have some miscellaneous things I wanted to address that didn't fit into previous sections. If you play the GBA games on a DS, they will not use the system's clock and magically fix everything. They rely solely on the battery inside the cart. I figured that most people know this, but I did get this question. Don't want to solder every time the battery runs dry? Lo and behold, the fabled battery holder. So before I thought these were only reserved for console game carts, turns out you can use battery holders for Game Boy games. I just didn't come across them at the time. I found these ones on Retro Game Repair Shop, which allow you to use regular batteries you'd find at the store. If you already have a pre-tapped battery like me, you don't need to worry about replacing it right now, but this might be a worthy replacement later down the line. But what if you have absolutely no other options to fix your battery? Well, you can still get by, you'll just be limited to some things. You can do what I did and use the Battle Tower cloning glitch, which can duplicate Pokemon and items, but only in Emerald. In case you don't know, it's incredibly easy and low risk. First, you need to have beaten the game and reached the Battle Frontier. Then go to the PC in the Battle Tower. You can clone multiple Pokemon at once. Just make sure they're in the PC first. If you want to clone certain items, just attach them to those Pokemon. I suggest the first two holding different items. Now save right in front of the PC and withdraw your Pokemon. Go to the rightmost counter, go through the dialogue, and choose preferably level 50 for ease of access. Now press yes once, and when the game asks you to save, reset the game, either by soft resetting or completely turning the game off. Once you reload, you should be in front of the counter, not the PC, despite saving there. Now check your party and your PC, and congrats! You successfully duplicated your Pokemon. After I grab the items, I usually release the extra Pokemon on in my party for cleanup, but you can leave them there if you want. Just make sure to empty the duplicates in your party and you're free to perform the glitch again. I use this for berries and especially TMs because I would like more than one Earthquake TM. Please and thank you. So you technically can obtain Milotic if you clone Pantry Berries, but you just need to treasure them because you aren't getting any more if they're gone. So this glitch is useful in a pinch, but it might be a little bit of a hassle. Plus time-based events still don't work. So it's up to you. Overall, Gen 3 feels like a transitional period between original games and modern installments. As new tech improves, so do the methods for world building and storytelling. And this iteration of the real-time clock is pretty much a relic of the past. Today, we can access time-based events without even thinking about it, because these batteries are no longer necessary. Initially, I was really frustrated with this lack of future-proofing in Gen 3, because I want to be rewarded for checking back every day. I love how Hoenn takes advantage of time passing to feel like a living, breathing region. It's just unfortunately at the mercy of older technology. But thanks to this community of dedicated fans, there is a way to keep enjoying everything these games had to offer. I think that's pretty cool. I want to thank all of the people who contributed the tools and information to this guide, and to whoever commented on my last video, letting me know much more about this topic. I learned a lot from this, and I'm so happy to say that we now have the tools. So thank you for watching, and I hope I was able to do this topic more justice. Now go and enjoy Gen 3. Okay, bye.